put anything down. I don't think it was so much of a flashy thing. You remember, well, first of all, I was in college. I was a meditator, uh, and I was in a really stressed out state of mind. I don't know how many term papers were coming up and this and that and the other. And, and you know, like what I also heard yesterday on television, 94% of American university students are highly stressed. I mean, it's so sad, and they talked about uh, the Danish give, they pay students to go to school. There are no student loans. Now, of course, there's going to be some stress because they have to qualify for the test in order to get into their colleges. And here, of course, you know, talk about a money industry, the universities. Right. I didn't realize 94%. I mean, it's heartbreaking. So with that thinking, I was feeling that kind of student stress. But at any rate, I sat down to meditate, and I don't know why, but I started to have very, very, very clear, I'm going to say this because I'm going to compare it with something else, out-of-body experience in the sense that all of a sudden it was very clear to me that there was there was me without a name or anything, and how, how the, the self-identity, what we call the small self, Hella or Scott or Paula, was almost so... So almost silly, it was very blissful, that there were no boundaries of, around an identity or anything. I was absolutely the energy right there in the room. And it was wonderful. It wasn't silly. It was this light bliss and the aha of what all of this is about. And then maybe right at the same time, I don't remember anymore, my body started moving. It wasn't like a little lift off, you know, of the ground, like on a carpet or something. It was just an up and down movement of my whole body, but that was irrelevant compared to the the feeling I was having inside, or just the experience. And some years later, I had a a bad bicycle accident, and I hit my head on a pavement. It was bleeding, and um, I ended up being rushed to the hospital and stitched up. And I didn't. I had brief amnesia. I didn't know who I was. I had no identity. It was the exact same experience of watching myself and realizing this whole connected feeling um, that there was no separation, absolutely oneness. So I know it sounds, it's very hard to describe. I was trying to think of how you describe it in a deep meditation, or I thought, well, is it how you try to describe an orgasm? You can't exactly explain it. It just happens naturally. But it wasn't the overwhelming feeling of a sexual orgasm. It was just so... Um, uh, immediate and cl- easy to, it was integrated completely. The reason I'm so interested in this, Hella, is because it has to do with bringing a very abstract experience of transcendental consciousness onto the body. Be- and, and that's why I was there's, so... There's one thing that I want to butt in and say that I think is very important. Is You remember when Maharishi used to say, the best experience is no experience? Yes, and and I think the reason is, and you can probably say it better than me. Um, you don't want to give all these little superficial thoughts and expressions, and it it takes away from the moment and the real experience, which is just this oneness. I, I don't know. People have it probably at different times. I, I don't know. There's so much to say about it. I know there's so much to say about something that you have to be very careful about talking about, least it be misunderstood. Or something that's so natural. It's just so normal. Right. You know, having a... Uh, we, I think it's because we're so caught up in the relative daily activity. Uh, again, going back to what we said earlier, we don't even know what to eat because we're in such a hurry. We don't have time to stop and listen to how does our body feel with this. So how does our mind feel with reality? You know, how to, what is it? You know, well, let me just stay on the surface with more TV and more, not that all that's bad, it's all in doses. There's some great things television offers, absolutely. You know, the internet, um, I, I hesitate to use the word balance, but a little bit of everything. No, definitely balance, because at a time when our economy is global, we need to have the internet so we know the human beings behind the products, you know, as suppliers and as consumers. But I still wanted uh, to go back to that experience. You, at that time, had been aware that levitation was being touted as something that could be experienced through Maharishi's organization, right? Yeah, definitely. 
And and you also, like me, you know, it, we didn't have easy access to, I think it was $3,000 to get the course, right? Yeah, it was called The Cities for people who are listening, yeah. So was any of that, at least it planted in your Oh, way? absolutely, absolutely. If anything, I think it planted the possibility. Right. And right. that's all we need to, to, to have in life. And, and uh, wouldn't you think in anything, you know, they talk about all the positive thinking or the secret and uh, who is that, Abraham Chandler, having the, 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 just the ability to think that. Exactly. By ourselves, we it, could do that. Exactly, to put a model out there like that. Because I remember later on when I asked model, you. Model, just a possibility. Yeah, yeah. And, and to me, that's what the miracles are about. If a master can demonstrate uh, his command over what we think are the limit of possibilities, and he goes into an unlimited place, we... The we... only thing is, is you don't want people distracted with miracles. That's why, to me, the levitation wasn't even an issue, you know. It, it was the experience of what was happening in my in my mind or, or consciousness that was what was important do you think it was have... about the levitation or the crying rock or you know really do you think it would have happened if you didn't even know it was possible uh, that i don't know i don't know because i i mean i know the end Forget of the if we had never heard about it i'm serious about that oh i don't think i i never learned much about orgasms so I don't, you know, I, you think it's necessary to know about them before you explain? I don't know. Them? That's why I'm asking. Um, that's a good question. Everybody's totally different experience. I mean, you know, when little kids are like toddlers, you can kind of see they're masturbating. They don't know they are. That, that's natural instinct, you know, sexual development. Um, but okay. does it mean everybody has an orgasm? That, that probably gets into a whole other show. No, no, but, but actually now that you've gone there... Um, you know, then then you can study the body again, and you can watch what is this experience doing to my body and doing yes. to my psychology, and then you can le learn about energy loss and energy gain and things like that. But going back to your experience with the levitation, you when I asked you later, after you had the formal training, uh, you know, with Marishi's, you know, with the Transcendental Meditation Group, mm -hmm. I asked you which was the better experience, and remember what you told me. I actually I don't. I'm dying to hear what I said because I could tell you now what I think. Uh, well, why don't you tell me now? Uh, was the one I had spontaneously. That's exactly what you told me, and that that made a lot of sense to me. And that's what Jean Klein excited me so much. He said, "Meditation is not something that you do in a mechanical way. That at a certain time of day you sit yeah. down." He said, "It's an invitation, and it's a moment by moment experience all day long. You never let go." Yes. of this inquiry of who am I and I thought either Jean Klein doesn't know what he's talking about because TM was such a powerful experience or he's saying something really tremendous so mm -hmm. it, again it goes back to the development of the individual nervous system right you know there's a lot of I don't know if you know this popular guy Scott's probably heard of him um, the, what's his uh, I'm getting all excited here. The guy who talks about in the moment. Oh, Eckhart Tolle? Yeah, yeah. There's an element of that there, too, is what he's trying to say, don't you think? I haven't followed him closely. Yes, but. yes. The only th I think they say Eckhart Tolle, because uh, Oprah Winfrey is starting to promote him. But, but again, uh, it gets down to this, um, if you're so immersed in this philosophy of, of um, letting everything be as it is and every moment's perfect, then you don't exert your willpower to create something else. And so I was just suggesting, and the circumstances that you had this levitation experience, you were highly stressed, but you also had an extraordinary model put in front of you. So as I remember you telling me about it, you um, were a little remorseful that you didn't have the money to learn. Mm -hmm. And so that there was a desire to know, even though you never talked about it to anybody, you probably, by not talking about it to us and being cool and not caring about something that you couldn't have, you probably did build up your power, but you held a little seed within you that said something more is possible and I want to experience that. Oh, definitely. 
I think my remorse, though, was the term paper for sure. <laughs> the remorse being that what does this college stuff have to do with reality, which every student must go through. Wow. Uh, which is so sad because, to me, college was such a wonderful uh, experience and luxury and a little older so I could understand more about what Shakespeare was about and it had more relevance. A lot of people, I'm sure, look right. back and have had that. I, I, um, right, I right. think that that's it, it's certainly for high school. How did you feel in high school, Scott? Did you feel like, what does this have to do with my life? Um, I felt very disconnected with a lot of people because everyone uh-huh. was like partying and doing mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. I was more like of a... Artistic. Did you like the classes? Uh, not, not necessarily. I didn't like math. I mean, uh-huh. <laughs> English. But did you have the feeling like, what does algebra have to do with it? With life, with what I'm thinking right now? <laughs> At certain points, and I, I, I guess, well, right now, it, I, I think definitely, you know, everything, uh, everything is, you know, the more knowledge you have, the more power you have. Yeah, but, but it's, it's I, hard to enjoy something when you're so stressed and you don't even know what's up or down in your life. That That's the real um, thing that hurts me about what I see high school students going through and what I went through. But, you know, on that note, I had started TM when I was 17, my senior year of, of high school, and I started to prove to my sister that it wouldn't work because I was tired of hearing her talk about it <laughs> and telling my friends and interrupting. This is a true story. It's like, get out. You know, I'm sick of hearing about it. So finally, <laughs> I said, I'll just start and prove it doesn't work, period. So I really went in with that attitude, and I was initiated in a little room. I, I almost started laughing when I saw the ceremony. Anyway, long story short, I learned that I walked out of this uh, little center, and everything looked incredible, visually clear. Howard Stern talks a little bit about that, more that he stopped smoking, but I I was kind of like what his mother was like. I felt so happy, and I really didn't have a clue why or could hardly believe it. But I started getting straight A's in school. I just felt better. I actually spoke in the morning instead of being... So I had almost a bit of a cliche-sounding experience, but it was true especially a jaded 17-year-old. Why would I lie about it, you know? But, Hella, let's, let's go on one point here. You were talking about the annoying aspect of my proselytizing, and we were commenting when we were listening to Howard Stern talking about his tribute to Maharishi, that although he was saying it wasn't a cult, he himself was, was starting to act annoying. And I want to take responsibility for having annoyed you, but um, what, what do you think about it? I, and at the same time, you have to admit Howard has reminded you to meditate, right? Oh, oh, yeah. No, I've been thinking about it. It's the pros and cons of things. I mean, I even feel like Howard going on, a, that's why I brought him up, I guess, you know, it was, even my brother said this too, you know, the flowers were more in focus. Everything looked so incredible visually. So I guess that's the nervous system getting the, the deep state of rest. What, whatever the reasons are, you can't help but sound a little bit cliche, and I, I also felt Howard couldn't help but to sound that way because he really meant it. Well, that's where I think Jean Klein said you could always tell a TM person uh, a block away. He goes, it was like they're bitten by a snake. And this was a very interesting expression he used because later on when I did start to learn in the south of India with this other younger master, there was a lot of metaphors about the cobra and they say the young cobra has a more dangerous poison than the older cobra. So on one hand, it seems as though Guru Dev, Maharishi's teacher, when he went to his teacher, he said that what he wanted was self-sufficiency. So I think he was very savvy that when you're in the presence of a great master, you can have enormous peace, but the peace is so big that it sort of wipes away your own dream and your own struggle and something that you have to go through. Does that make well, sense? I don't know. I mean, I I have to confess, in, in the, when we all listen, sometimes we hold on one point. I don't want to forget to respond, but, you know, one man's poison is another man's medicine. I, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm thinking, you remember when Maharishi said to you, keep it simple? Sometimes we have to slow down and go and in more measured steps here. We're, we're covering a lot suddenly, for me anyway. Right, right. I, I don't mean to take the air out of your balloon, you know, by saying no, I, simple, I, but No, I, I want you to take the air out of yeah. the balloon. Oh, I'm just, I'm just being 
I have no premeditated thoughts here. Um, I don't want to take the air out of anybody's balloon, but I want to. No, but the balloon that we're that we're considering is cults because it's clean. yeah, yeah. Okay, it's, thanks for refocusing. No, it, because some of the most um, profound work that's done on the 9/11 research shows that cult mentality prevents people from seeing the reality. Here's a, hey, I have an idea. What about using another word? Because cult just shuts me down. I just, like, freeze. But remember when Jen was reading, that's her mother, the book on the famous philosopher I can't think of now, about crowds, the right. power of crowds? Yes, yes, yes. What was yes. his name? And it's the same, I believe it's the same thing that you're talking about, cults, crowds gathering together, you know, do you, can you... Can you elaborate on that? I'm too excited. Scott, Scott, <laughs> Scott, do you know anything about this, that, that there are bodies of knowledge? There's actually a website you can go to called Strategic Communication Laboratory CC, and it talks about using communication skills that have been developed in 47 universities to go way beyond advertising and pushing a product, but to go to where you run entire governments, and they say, if you don't learn this, somebody else will. Have you ever thought of that, Scott? Because I know you have talked about the cult of Alex Jones. Sure. Do you have any comments? Hella, you don't. Hella, first of all, is there another word that we can use besides cult? I was going to ask you that. That's why I was bringing up crowds, um, motivating crowds together. I mean, okay, here's a crude example, but what about like people getting stoned when the whole crowds get together? Um, you mean like Jesus with the woman? He said uh, anybody or people being stoned to this day when they do something uh, wrong. The, the the intensity that the group consciousness that gets built up is so powerful. Well, maybe that's why Jesus was tracing in the sand when they said we have to stone this woman because according to the Torah she violated. You know, and he says whoever has no no sin throw the first stone. And, right, he without and he, sin cast the first stone. But well, how? It, let's just go back for a second. How are you defining cult? Well, let me let, let me ask Scott. What, Scott, yeah. Scott, what do you think? Because because you really lived through this, you know. He's trying to do a creative work, and he he came right up against the problem. Oh, I didn't know that. Can you want? Can Scott. you, Scott? Okay. Well, basically, uh, I had gotten in touch with this organization, We Are Change, and we were discussing, you know, uh, you know, I, I'd seen their videos online, and I was very interested in documenting them because I wanted to make a change. I was mm -hmm. in the politics, I still am, was very upset of how, you know, the government's been treating us and stuff and you know, how our rights are being taken away. And so I saw a video of Matt Lapasic, uh, which is one of the 9-11 truth activists, getting kicked out of, uh, of the Republican uh, National Convention, I believe it was uh, some point in 2007, mm -hmm. like in May or April. And um, that really struck a chord with me. And I wanted to start documenting them. And when I went at, went down, I said, yeah, let's just think about it for a second. Because, you know, we had another documentary filmmaker want to shoot us, but it didn't work out. Like, okay. So uh, we had started working together. And uh, well, we didn't really work together. I wasn't a part of their organization. And my fear was that, you know, as time progressed, you know, they were asking for unedited, unedited tapes. And my fear was that my tapes, my work, was going to get in the wrong hands. Mm. Like Alex Jones or someone who... Um, I don't know Alex Jones. But hey, hang on, Scott. You didn't have a problem with Alex Jones at this point, did you? No, no. No issue no. with him. He didn't... He doesn't, he didn't I don't you know. guys need to define who Alex okay, Jones let, let's is, or is it just me? No, no, no. Let, people are listening. Let's explain to my sister who Alex Jones is. Now, I'll, I'll just run through and maybe Scott can correct me. Okay. He's, he's a, a Republican or he's sort of a, a, a conservative uh, redneck guy that appeals more to blue collars. Mm -hmm. He's not what you'd call the liberal, more educated type. And he is the one, the only one in the mainstream that talks about 9-11 truth. Oh. Now, Scott, maybe you can elaborate more than I. Yeah, well, basically, yeah, so Alex Jones has a, has a huge following, and he, I guess, incorporated um, his slogan, or I guess, you know, the people, you know, a young group of kids uh, called We Are Change, and they all got together, and, uh, you know, Alex Jones sent them uh, cameras and, 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 you know, made banners, I believe, and, and it promoted the slogan, 9-11 was an inside job. And what they were doing, you know, they were every Saturday, 
they go down to Ground Zero, they're still there, and they, you know, hand out flyers, DVDs, et cetera, of, like, Loose Change, you know, the DVD Loose Change, uh, mm-hmm. Eric Storm, all, all these videos. And um, basically what had happened was, you know, we had uh, we had talked in the beginning about um, sharing footage, you know, each, each person sharing footage. But as the documentary went, went, went along, there was, I started seeing that, you know, my footage wouldn't have matched with theirs. And I think maybe they had thought that I was working with them directly, and I was, and I wasn't. You know, I, I loved the group, I was a part of the group, but I wasn't shooting with them. So I think this whole big thing happened when Luke kept on asking me for tapes, and I finally, you know, gave him some clips. He was like, are you serious? What is this? You know, and it and, it, and I said, well, it's what I have in my documentary. Why should I give you more than what I have in my documentary that I'm not going to use, you know, if, if this is my, you know, my work and I'm not working for anyone. So then this whole big situation came about and, and now they didn't want me to shoot there anymore. And oh, hey, hang big... on, hang on, Scott, just a second. Um, you had intended from the very beginning to produce a documentary, right? Correct. Okay, was that clear to them? Yes, and this is for, this, okay. is, this is about the truth movement. 9-11 Truth Movement. Right. But because of, you know, all the situations that had happened, the group was like, well, we don't want you to document us. I, you know, I guess they were upset at the time because, you know, maybe they didn't know the whole story or they didn't agree with me. And, you know, basically everything fell apart and, you know, and they banned me. And, and, and what, what I question is, if they're, so, if they're so interested in getting the word out about things and, and looking for freedom, then why would they ban a filmmaker, you know, from doing it? But I, looking back, in retrospect, I can understand it. Um, for me, I have enough footage that I can use in order to make a, a segment that would work. But I, I, would, I still wish that we could have went more into Building 7, you know, all these things that I think needs to be talked about. Cause now so it sounds like they, excuse me for interrupting, I just want to make sure I understand, they wanted to control all of the footage? I believe so, yes. Uh-huh. And they wanted my all, all my unedited tapes. And I talked to my friends. I was like, my filmmaker friends, I'm like, what do you think I should do? Like, oh. dude, you don't work for them. They, you don't owe them anything. Now, for example, though, Paula. You know, me and Paula have worked, and we have shared videotapes. We have no issue with sharing with each other because I feel comfortable with someone like Paula. With yeah. them, I never really felt comfortable. Hey, hang on, I have to change a tape. and I want right, you're, Who kind of looks like Archie Bunker from my little screen that you have a camera on, the man. That the, the the guy shooting, you mean? Uh, no, no, you're shooting a picture of somebody. Uh, uh, it, it looks like a some some man in the middle of the screen. We're at your website, Scott. You're documenting. Yeah. Who's the guy in the middle? Oh, the guy. Oh, that's uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I didn't mean it as a mean joke. He just no, no. it's just from my little screen. It looks like yeah. that's a good friend of mine, uh, Robert Youngren. He's an actor uh, from Long Island, and uh, oh, good guy, good guy. Yeah, Paula, oh, sure. we're we're gonna have some some panel discussions about about artists and some of the people that he's working with. Oh, um, what I wanted to say now that I've changed tapes is, I sort of put out to my sister who, like me, has had a lot of experience with transcendental meditation. I don't think she got quite as fanatically involved as I did, but she still has a good idea of the experience itself and of the organization that grew up around the experience. Now we were talking to Scott Goldberg about his experience with some of the patterns that I noticed. We tended not to, Hella wants a word other than cult, and I'm not sure what the word is to use. When you have a a body of people who are subscribing to a certain philosophy or theory or strategy for success, and I'll, I'll use cult in terms of cultivation and culture, because that's where culture and cult comes from the same root. But my problem with the cult or culture or, you know, intentional community, whatever you want to call it, is that when it comes to the individual reaching within himself and expressing his unique dream, sometimes it butts up against what is expected of the sort of group dynamic. Now, do you think it's because within the group dynamic there become certain standards everybody wants to live up to? For example, gee, why aren't you a vegetarian? The, these, what Maurice used to call mood making. What do you think, Scott? Uh, like I said before, I think it's I think it's really up to the person. Um, well, but in your own particular case, can you begin to see Hella what he went through as expressed before I changed the tapes? 
that he was doing a creative he he was working on a creative project yeah yeah and, yeah and within that group that he's trying to support there's um i almost want to say uh powers stations of command starts or maybe in this case it they aren't real maybe there's something else going on there i don't know but but power plays within the group that initially has good intentions yes. certainly tm had a tremendous bureaucracy and I suppose hierarchy, but then we can't help but to admire certain people um, that speak well or have a certain charisma, so we start to look towards them. You know, Paul is some of the older guys in the TM movement. Right, right. Gary right. Jarvis, you know, he didn't right. necessarily want that attention. I mean, I didn't know him personally, but there's always going to be figures that you go towards. Right. Because they express what we want to express so well. Right, um, right. So... There could be accidental stuff within a cult. I don't know. I, I mean, oh, there's so many examples. You could go into nature with alpha dogs and things like that, you know. But yeah, I think for me, the reason why I shut down with cult, I'm like the average American person where you think of some of the destruction that has happened. It's turned into a very negative term. Well, I think, though, in that case, that's why I pointed out this strategic communication laboratory where there's actually a masterminded plan in order to deceive people and to push through an agenda, that they do that. They, they, they may create uh, very destructive cults, then, then give a lot of media attention to it, kind of like you're saying you would trust your own child to have judgment on the email and so on, but there's a push to sort of take, take that all away so that the censorship is so tremendous, ostensibly to protect the children, but really did the children need to be protected? No, yeah. so there's a lot at once. So let's just go back to cult for a second. Um, where were we going to pick up again? Well, what I'd like to do is pick up on Scott Goldberg being yeah. being yeah. able to get the energy from We Are Change and get his dream done, but ha without having to give up his soul to do it. Exactly. Right, right. Or his trust or his hard work. Of course. I mean, I don't want the footage against him. You floor. know, Scott, I just had a flash. In terms of communication, did you, were you able or comfortable enough to ask somebody or explain, I feel, let's just say this is what you were feeling, I feel threatened to give up my work? I and I, yes, we had a, we had a meeting. In you did. Place, and uh, where, you know, um, everyone, it was like 25 people to one in a sense, you know, it was just getting the whole group and they were really getting it up and it was, re it was really getting heated. And uh, uh, there was a point where I was like saying like certain things like, like I was cursing out people, you know, it was like,